Hi, I'm George Dory, and welcome to our Coast to Coast AM YouTube channel. Have fun, tell your friends, and share us with everyone. You can also find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, and Coast to Coast AM's mobile app. And always remember to log on to our website at coasttocoastam.com for daily articles, the best paranormal information, and all you need to know about your favorite guests. And now you can become a Coast Insider directly through the Coast mobile app. We welcome our international listeners and even offer a free two-week trial. So don't delay. Become an insider today. From the heartland of America and the gateway to the West, good morning, good evening, wherever you may be across the nation, around the world. I'm George Norrie. This is Coast to Coast AM. Archbishop Ron, welcome back. Thank you. Thank you, George. How are you? I'm doing fine. How about yourself? I've been pretty busy lately, considering I kind of call myself retired, but that's not really the case. Uh, people cannot, for some reason, cannot lose my phone number. People are constantly contacting me. And I'm constantly busy. So even though I'm in a somewhat uh, semi-retired uh, uh, position, I am still so busy you wouldn't believe it. I'm going to ask you to get closer to your microphone because you sound like you're in a tin can. Oh, boy. <laughs> okay. I, I can assure you I'm not in a tin can, <laughs> but I'm right here. Can you hear me any better? A little better, a little better. So we'll keep our fingers crossed and hope the demons aren't trying to keep you away from us. This is a very, very good possibility. You know, it does happen, especially when we're dealing with uh, electronics and, and all this modern technology, you know. Um, yeah, it's it's pretty interesting. How did you become interested in exorcisms? You know, it all happened. It was a uh, supernatural event that occurred when I was 11 years old. And I, uh, I was in, in the bathroom taking a shower, and this super bright light just illuminated the entire bathroom. It came through the bathroom window, and it was so bright, I had to shut my eyes. As I did, I saw myself in the future. And keep in mind, I'm only 11 years old. I saw myself in the future wearing a Roman collar and serving the church in some capacity. And then it... At, at that split second, I opened my eyes, and I could just see the vapors just leave the bathroom, and it just simply dissipated. And ever since then, I've been uh, very much aware of, of the supernatural things that happen in the world. And it's like a new perspective. I, I just, I, I kind of like uh, uh, got a sense of the reality of what's going on. Did you did you come into this? Kicking and screaming, or was it really truly voluntary on your part? I, I consider it a divine calling. I believe that God had uh, communicated with me, and, and though 11 years old, I, I, I was apparently very open to whatever God had to say. I was right there and ready to listen and, and obey. And, and since that time, uh, throughout my life, I've started experiencing all types of really interesting things. That is, things that would be classified as unbelievable and pretty scary. Do you do you see demons outside the physical body or not? I do. I actually do. I, in fact, most of my ministry has been spent in the Skid Row areas of downtown Los Angeles. And most of the time, the either the owner or the management of these Skid Row hotels would contact and they would ask if uh, if I could do some form of assessment and see what's going on. And so as a result, um, and this started like in the very early 1980s. And so we started um, uh, making these calls and making assessments, and uh, and it just took off from there. You have to understand that most people that live in these Skid Row hotels, uh, they like fall under you know the, the category of of being desperate. Perhaps maybe uh, they're down on their luck. They might have substance abuse problems, uh, maybe even um, uh, issues with the, uh, you know, law enforcement. And, and so crime is always there. And then they're very suicidal. You have overdoses. You have all kinds of things, which means that there's a spiritual residual that's left in that structure. So when that happens, supernatural things take place. That is, you know, walls start banging. Uh, people uh, can can swear that they hear whispering, and, and these are just like one or two floors. There's one.
one hotel in uh, in Skid Row in, in downtown Los Angeles. It has uh, 14 stories, and this type of activity occurs. It has been occurred uh, occurred yet every uh, ever since 1920s. So I mean, this is an old hotel, and you have all these spiritual uh, uh, residuals from people who have uh, who have committed suicide. Uh, jumped off the 14th floor and so on. And it's so interesting because throughout the entire uh, uh, hotel, it's only the 14th floor that has all these disturbances. Hmm. What does a demon look like, Archbishop? My, uh, and it's so funny because I, when I see them, they don't change. They, they have the same image. What I see is a gray, long face, and they're always wearing what appears to be a hood. And as a result, I've, I've seen them. <laughs> I tell people this, I think it's crazy. Um, <laughs> but, um, and, and I, I have two psychiatrists who are in our organization. They confirm that I'm not crazy. <laughs> but these things actually exist. Um, so as a result, um, uh, I have seen them. I've seen them in, especially uh, in hotels where there is a, a, a bona fide demonic infestation where everything, the, the whole structure is being pounded by these uh, multiple demonic entities. And the people in these hotels, they are living uh, on, on the lowest level of life that you could even imagine. So a lot of them uh, are just suffering socially, and they have other social uh, uh, you know, uh, problems, but as a result, you know, they're they're living there. It's the only place. It's the next step of being homeless. You know, they're in that hotel, and that's that's their structure. And as a result, they have to experience all the residuals that have taken place in the past. And that would go for everything from suicides to uh, demonic possession uh, to uh, uh, things of this nature. It's very, very, uh, uh, it's very alarming to say the least. How many people who are possessed? are considered mentally ill, and they're really possessed. It's, a possible, it's very possible that they could have both going on. They could have a psychosis and still be possessed by a demonic entity. Um, and the reason what we do when we do our assessment, uh, we not only uh, record everything and, and we have a questionnaire that we, uh, that, that we direct to the victim and family members, but we also, uh, we also ask for a psychological report, uh, which they would furnish. And then once they furnish the psychological report from their doctors, we will uh, relay it to our psychiatrist, and they will review the actual reports. And if it's something that, that, that needs our attention or, or, or there's nothing at all, they, they will let us know. If it's a normal uh, type of scenario or if it's something that's really, uh, uh, really telling in regards to uh, some form of psychosis, then they would uh, alert us. But understand, there are certain things that um, that mental illness uh, will not um, uh, will not show. Uh, for example, um, mental illness can mimic possession, and possession can mimic mental illness. So you see, there's a very fine line there. But when you see the victim levitate, when you see the victim uh, uh, in an environment where things are flying around. And, uh, and and everything is defying the laws of gravity, then you have to understand that this is not a psychosis. Right. You know, we are dealing with something supernatural, and as a result, you know, we have, we have to be on our toes and document everything and make sure we have the, uh, the proper uh, support system in place. We normally have some medical uh, practitioner who's with our assessment team, and that's either a practical nurse or a LVN, or, uh, or, or something like this, where we have someone who is medically trained. In the event, as we're doing the evaluation, and by the way, I'm not involved in the evaluations. I, I oversee the evaluations by, by examining them and making a final decision based on our psych, uh, psychiatrist uh, uh, recommendations. Um, so I don't make a decision until we have all the paperwork in. So understand, I'm not even on site when the first contact interview is made. Uh, we rely on our laity, and sometimes we do have a clergy member who is uh, who is, wants to join in on the uh, on the assessment team. But what they do basically is they uh, not only interview the victim, but they also get the input from the family 
members and even the neighbors in regards to what's happening. And then at that point, there's always someone, and these days everyone has a live phone, so everyone has a recorder. So everyone that's on the team, they're, they're literally not only um, focusing on, on the victim, but they're also looking for outward manifestations that are around the victim or within the house or within the, whatever structure it is. And if there is some type of physical movement where we can actually see something going on, then that's considered uh, proof that we have to further investigate. Now, we do that by investigating not only the individual, but we also investigate the property. We investigate the house. We see if there's any history, uh, anything that may have uh, occurred. It's interesting, though, uh, there have been quite a few uh, residents where where we have found that there were human sacrifices made. And we're talking about, you know, 100 years ago or so. Uh, and as a result, the, the residual is still in the structure, which means that you have, you know, an ideal uh, uh, situation for uh, a, a, a demonic infestation. Ron, what is the procedure to determine whether someone needs to be exercised or not? Do you have a checklist of questions? What do you go through? In the individual, as well as the physical manifestations, uh, we ask them a series of questions, and uh, and once we have the answers, uh, we uh, we we simply uh, compile all the other information, the evidence. Evidence could be uh, maybe some type of video or photographs of some type of uh, activity taking place. Uh, of course, a video uh, a presentation is more effective when we could actually see uh, a, a, a manifestation take place where things are flying off the shelves or, or things in this nature, or we're recording uh, the sounds that are coming from the walls when there's nothing on the other side of the wall, but it's the outside of the wall, and you can hear the sounds coming in. Um, so, you know, we analyze all of this information. And then, of course, we have the psychological reports that are submitted uh, by, uh, by the family's uh, psychiatrist or psychologist. And then we pass those on to our uh, medical uh, staff and uh, we get their feedback. Once I have their feedback, then I can make a proper assessment uh, in regards to the final decision as to whether or not we should perform an actual exorcism. Now, it depends where the jurisdictional uh, bishop is located. Understand, I have bishops in 24 countries around the world. I have, uh, and also in 19 states, U.S. states. So each of these uh, jurisdictions, there's a bishop. And the bishop is in charge of that jurisdiction. He has his own investigation team. And in that investigation team, they would do the first contact. They would uh, uh, collect all the evidence or the lack of evidence in regards to what the case is all about. We have to verify that it's a truly a, a demonic issue and not just simply someone's imagination or some form of psychosis. We have to, there's a very fine line there. If it's, it's surely, if it's, if, if there's some type of, uh, of um, psychological uh, issue involved and there's no demonic and we decide to actually uh, approve an exorcism, then that could drive the victim further into their psychosis and they could have a mental breakdown, which could lead to suicide. And yes, there have been a lot of people that have actually died during the, uh, the actual ritual, uh, but for many different reasons, mainly because of what's going on within themselves. It could be a health issue, it could be a psychological issue, or it could be a real demonic issue that's going on within their, within their environment. If that happens, then we have to uh, make sure that we make a proper call in regards to whether or not it's genuine. Has anybody tried to trick you as a joke? Yes. Many, uh, unfortunately, many times. I'm, I'm going to give this number out, okay? And it's very accurate. Okay, I, I've been doing this for a very long time, over four decades. And I can tell you that we've had thousands of documented cases, thousands. And I can tell you out of those thousands and thousands, let's just say, uh, we'll, we'll round it up to about, let's say every thousand cases that come in uh, requesting an evaluation and, and requesting a, an actual ritual. What we'll do is the whole process. And after all that process is done, then we'll make a decision. We can actually verify if any of the, uh, let's say, the, the thousand, okay, cases are, are genuine. Out of the thousand, we might get, are you ready for this? About five. Five genuine cases out of a thousand. 
Now that means that that wow. majority, more than half, it's a majority. It can be either explained. Uh, there's uh, some natural uh, phenomenon that's happening, and if that be the case, then obviously we we can't uh, go through with a natural ritual. The ritual doesn't come until we, after we do the entire uh, the entire assessment process, the investigations, uh, the collection of evidence, and the examination of the psychological profiles. So I mean, there's a whole big process involved, and there's many uh, different groups that have to collaborate in order for us to make. Uh, a decision in, in a timely fashion. Now, the timely fashion could be anywhere from, and unfortunately this is a fact if it's done properly, anywhere from three to six months before we can actually make a decision. And that sounds like a very long time. But as I said, we're very thorough. We have to make sure that we uh, take the analytical approach and make sure that we have the medical community, the psychological community, the health community on, on board with with, with, with the various things that we do. As you probably know, um, there have been cases in the past where the clergy have been held accountable because uh, the victim uh, died, okay, uh, uh, while they were doing the, the ritual. This has happened many a times. You don't hear very much uh, about these cases, but they do exist. So uh, we have to be uh, extremely careful uh, and, and make sure that what we're doing is uh, that our assessments are accurate and, uh, and there's enough documentation and evidence that we can go forward and actually do a ritual. What do they die of? Natural causes? What happens to them? Uh, heart attacks. Uh, sometimes uh, there was one person that uh, died of suffocation. <laughs> uh, suffocation? Suffocation, oh. you know, the lack of oxygen and just uh, their heart stopped. Um, heart attacks, of course, uh, there's just so many things. Before I forget, George, um, I have to tell you, I, I never have a problem with the audio uh, on my on my devices. Um, I do podcasts. Uh, I'm on a podcast show. Uh, one of my colleagues that you that I know you know very well is going to be on, and you're going to be interviewing him, uh, I think, within a, a month or so. Um, and he's a spiritual warrior. That's Reverend Bill Bean. Oh, yeah. Um, I'm going to be with him in Columbus at, at a live event as well. We did a we did a, a seminar convention in um, in Connecticut uh, just a few months ago. He's such a great guy, and I've known him for so many years. And it was the first time we actually met physically. Since then, I've been a, a, a guest on his podcast every Friday. So uh, I'm on his Worry of Mode program. It's called, and uh, and I'm there just uh, you know just to give my input. But. Bill, Reverend Bill is probably one of the most powerful spiritual warriors I know. He is. He in everything he says, and he's very effective. Do you know what he does? He, he drives. He drives from state to state trying to help people in his uh, ministry of deliverance. I mean, he just, uh, I mean, he sacrifices so much of his time, energy, and, and even his, his financial support, I'm sure. And he, uh, just to help individuals. He's such a wonderful man. That's what I... So honored to be affiliated with him. That's great. Let's go back to your headsets on, by the way. Put them back on, okay? Oh, okay. I will do that. Let's One do second. that. I think we can get a little better quality out of you. I'm so, you. so sorry about that. And I'm, I'm going to try to explain that to you, too, by the way. Because this is not a natural thing. Hold on. But why would anybody want to be an exorcist? Well, it's not a job. And it's not something that anyone would want to do. <laughs> what it is, it's a calling. When God calls you, when the Creator calls you, and you know it's a divine calling, it's something that you follow. It's your belief system that God has called or chosen you to do this type of ministry. Not everyone can do an exorcism. Not everyone can do what we do and, and actually survive it. <laughs> and to be effective, we have to have that divine calling. So it, it's, not, it's not a choice. Well, it, it is a choice for, for us. Uh, personally, but it's it's not like something that that it was that it's not our desire to be a nexus. It just happens to be that we were called to do this. How does the initial call come to you? What is it? Who is it? Well, as I said, my experience was when I was 11 years old, and I heard uh, and saw myself in the future, and that's when this bright light burst in the bathroom. Uh, while I was taking a shower, and I closed, I shut my eyes, and I saw everything. And it, I I believe that was a, a divine uh, a vision, if you want, if you want to call it that. And as a result, um, it my life, my whole perspective changed at that point. And I understand 
I was only 11 years old. But uh, but everything changed from that point. But I mean, who makes that initial call to you that my uncle needs an exorcism or my son is oh, possessed? Well, in, this, in, in this case, okay, we have uh, websites, we have uh, forums, okay, uh, worldwide. And when people have a problem within their family, they feel that there's some type of a, a supernatural thing occurring. Perhaps something is happening within the family unit, and they can't explain it. They would uh, look someone up, and we're all over the place. You know, we're, we're online, and, and people can just contact us. And there's an actual form that they have to fill out. They have to give us their name, uh, you know, the phone number, their email address, their physical location. And also a detailed uh, description as to what's going on in their situation. And then at that point, we follow up uh, with our, our assessment team. They would make the first call, the first contact. And at that point, they would do the interview, they'd do the investigation, do the evaluation, and then they'll collect all the information we need so we can make a valid uh, decision as to whether or not we should go through with an exorcism. Are you the last person they call when they're going through this process? I would be, uh, no, actually, I'm actually the first person. <laughs> I'm the first person they would call, but then at that point, I would contact all of my members worldwide, and I'd send them a mass email. And I do that, uh, the last one I sent was today. <laughs> and so all my members would receive an email. The email will have all the details, all the, uh, all the things that they're, they're requesting in regards to uh, help and assistance. And then if they're within their jurisdiction, they would contact me and say, I'm going to work the case. And at that point, they would assign their assessment teams, which is local. Uh, for example, you know, we have, we have teams in the Philippines. We have teams in Poland uh, or even Canada. And, and, and if somebody in Canada contacts, you know, and, and hits my, my website and contacts it and requests uh, uh, our help, then I would contact uh, everyone, not just one person in Canada. I would contact everyone because there are some people, like like I said, like even my colleague would do it, would go out of state and help an individual. Okay, and and that's why it, it's so important that you contact the right people when you have demonic issues. Archbishop, what is that one major factor that leads you to believe this person is possessed? Um, solid objects like nails, glass, uh, rocks, um, and when things like that uh, occur, when they start levitating, when they start like hitting the ceiling uh, or stuck to the wall where they're suspended and they're just stuck on the wall. It, you know, it's so bizarre. It sounds so bizarre. But when these things happen, you know that they're supernatural things and they're all tied in to what's going on in the individual's life. And at that point, they're at the lowest, the lowest point in their life. I mean, they are, uh, first of all, they have no control of what's happening. And as a result, the demonic will actually use the body like a puppet. And the personality of the, of the demonic will actually manifest. And you can see not only the gurgling voice and maybe speaking in different languages or having super strength, all those things, those things can also be explained uh, psychologically. But when you see a person who's stuck to the wall, or if you see a person that's just about hitting the ceiling and, and with no support, defying all laws of gravity, but when you see things happening around that person where things are flying around uh, the house and, and in the room within the immediate space of the individual, then you know it's not a psychosis. So when we get in, uh, evidence like that and we have enough evidence uh, to support a case uh, along with the psychological profile, then we will uh, proceed from there. What does the demon want, Archbishop? What's their end game? Their end game is to destroy God's creation. Ever since Lucifer was thrust out of hell, uh, out of heaven, I should say, and took one third of the angels, which the fallen angels are referred to as demons now, uh, when Lucifer came down, okay, uh, he came down and he was, he was thrown out of heaven after rebellion. He was just being so rebellious, he wanted to, to, to be like God, he wanted God. To, he wanted God to actually be uh, uh, his equal, and, and so on. And, and God would not allow that. So when Satan was thrown, or Lucifer was thrown uh, out of heaven, uh, and then now we know him as Satan and all the demons, fallen angels, the demons. 
uh, where that happens. They want revenge. They want to, to, to retaliate. And that is the only best way to do that is to, is to uh, destroy God's creation, which, uh, which is mankind. So their end goal is to destroy us. Now, they won't hurt us physically, but they will drive us to a point where we find ourselves hurting ourselves. That is, um, they'll, they'll drive us to a point where we will destroy ourselves uh, physically, mentally, uh, or both. And so that, that type of scenario is a very real thing. So, so the demonic will actually uh, try to, um, to, and this is where, where demonic oppression comes in, by the way. Uh, it's just like an implant. The, the, the demonic will actually implant an idea in the subconscious uh, brain. And, and that person will actually think that their bad behavior, negative behavior, is actually a normal thing. Because they, they have no idea that they have been uh, intruded or, or, um, or uh, gained entry by this, by this demonic uh, entity. And so as a result, their whole, their whole demeanor, their whole outlook would be not only negative, but this is the type of thing that would go on with serial killers. Um, and, and you see that same look, the same stare that they have. It's all because of the demonic oppression that's very, very soft, which can lead to demonic possession. Archbishop, how long does it take from the process of you deciding to do the exorcism? How long does that process take? Normally takes three to six months, but I have to say one other thing, kind of a retraction, if you will. Since I'm semi-retired, I came up with an interesting idea. And if anyone goes to my website, www.orderofexus.com, they will, on the main page, if they scroll down, they will see the very first, the first ever that I know of anyway. We have, and I created the International Referral Directory. Now, in that directory, Uh, As you go down the main page, down the bottom, you will see members in my organization who are from around the country, who are around the world. Uh, Some of them, uh, I know our psychiatrist is listed there. We have have bishops. We have priests. We have lead um, uh, assessment investigators. We even have demonic profilers. And they're all listed in our international referral directory. So they have their picture their phone number, their physical, uh, where they're located, what country, what city they're they're in, and their email address. So they can contact them directly and bypass my whole process. And um, they can contact the jurisdictional bishop in that part of the world or or whatever state. And uh, and from that point on, it'll be something, it'll be a local operation, in other words. So, uh, see, I do the international when, um, when, when a victim cannot find a person on the on our international referral directory, and then at that point, I contact all of our members and I send their information, the victim's information, out to all our bishops, priests, and uh, psychiatrists, and so on. So all that information is sent out uh, when when they can't find someone uh, on our or in our uh, international referral directory. Does the demon ever lay low and trick you in that part? And what I mean by that is to let you think you've eradicated the demon from the individual and it's really in, it's dormant and hiding and waiting for you to leave? All the time. What it does, it will try to hide deep, deep, deep in the individual until it's cornered. And once it's cornered, uh, then it starts revealing itself. And uh, but at first, it could try to deceive you. It will try to distract you. It will try to uh, put the attention on someone who's in the room other than the victim. Uh, it could even be the exorcist, or it could be his assistant, or any of his team members. Um, something could happen where the individual will physically be harmed, uh, where things will actually, uh, um, you know, smash into them, uh, fly off the shelf, whatever. The point is. The demonic will try to distract the attention of the exorcist, and will do that by by using all these tricks, if you will. And understand, the actual demonic has insight in regards to every person that's in the room. So he'll use all the negative information about that person and bring it out. And that's a distraction. Once the distraction is there, then the demon is actually winning at that point. So once the once the exorcist gets back into control of the situation, then he's back in the fight. But the 
Athena is always trying to hide itself. And, and that's, a, that's a true scenario. Let's go to the phones. Let's start with Mike, west of the Rockies in Santa Cruz, California. Hi, Michael. Go ahead. Hey, thanks for taking my call, Archbishop. Um, my question uh, was in regard to uh, the battle being for our minds, and the uh, you know demons love to um, they love to disrupt uh, a person's life by uh, basically you know soul jacking or uh, planning a, a disruptive in the mind. And so m- my question to you would be, like in the example of Acts 19.15, when the seven sons of Sceva uh, tried to exercise a man, and they said, uh, in the name of uh, Jesus whom Paul preaches, we adjure you come out. And the demon actually said, you know, Jesus we know, Paul we know, but who are you? And the, he actually stripped the men of their clothes, and they ran from the house attempting exorcism naked. But uh, what do you think about, um, you know, for us in uh, being healed of demonic interference or even possession, the delivering power uh, that would help someone to be whole again from this uh, d- demonic uh, disruptiveness or uh, interference? Okay, let me, let me say this. First of all, the demonic is every uh, distraction attack. And, uh, and part of it is would be saying to you, you have no power over me. Uh, and they would say that to the, that the demonic would say that to the ex. You have no power over me. You're wasting your time. You know, if you continue to do this, you're going to be in a lot of trouble. You're, you're going to die. And then, you know, and then the family starts happening and all that's real. The point is, in the very beginning, in order for the demonic to actually uh, get to an individual. That individual has to do something. That individual has to uh, have his mind open to certain things. Um, we have this thing called the Internet, and as a result, the demonic will use the Internet with lots of negative information, and that will seep into the subconscious person who's watching uh, all of this information. As a result, okay, their defenses are really low at that point. The demonic can really zoom in on individuals. And literally go through the whole process. There's another uh, reason too. There's a lot of reasons why why something like that could happen. Uh, if a person is, let's say, addicted to drugs or uh, or some form of substance, their their natural defenses and mentally anyway are, are they've been shaken and and their mental uh, defense is down. As a result, the demonic can very easily uh, attack that individual and mentally plant a seed in that individual's mind. And it would be a negative uh, outcome at that point on. And that's how it would grow. That's how it could attack the individual. Would you, would you say, Archbishop, that the exorcisms are more than they were 10, 20 years ago? I'm going to say the, you mean the actual ritual? Yes. I mean, did, are you getting more cases Go to Ogden, Utah. DJ's with us on the wild card line. Hello, DJ. Hi, how are you doing, George? I Great. Uh, Thanks. just wanted to talk to the exorcist because I'm also an exorcist. And in the performances I've had, uh, I've noticed that the demon is only able to be in 
diminished by taking it up myself and converting it into positive energy through the gift of an exorcist, which makes an exorcist, you know, a chosen person to have that gift. So it's not something anybody would want. It's the most challenging thing you'll ever go through fighting a demon. And it's true. I just wondered if he has the same experience. Um, I will say that uh, um, most people who are in our uh, profession, if you will, have been called divinely, and as a result, we are protected. We have that extra line of protection. Now, it depends on the individual's faith. How strong is the exorcist's faith? Is his faith so strong that he could use that shield of protection that God has given him, and as a result, he is not uh, prone to be attacked, at least not directly? And when that happens, I, I think it, 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 it's a very real scenario. So in other words, if the exorcist has faith, a very strong faith, uh, a belief system, then uh, the odds are he's going to be successful in whatever he does, as long as he's done in, in the name of our Lord, Jesus Christ. Ron in Tennessee, take it away, Ronald. I am so honored to be able to talk to the Archbishop and to you, Mr. Nori. Thank you, Ron. I am, I am just, I'm going through some things here, but I'll tell you what, Satan's a liar. And he's a, the father of the lie that nailed Jesus to the cross. And I, I don't bow to him or any of his imps. I'm going to tell you, I've been through some stuff. I'm not going to tell you all of it, but I have faced the spirit of death and I, I just I just believe that if any Christian who really believes in Christ would just stand up against these spirits through the cross, through what Jesus did. I I don't think a lot of people realize what Jesus went through when he died on the cross. He was humiliated. He was abased down to the very bottom. But he gave up his deity to save our soul. And I love him. I'm going to leave you with that. I love him. And he has saved me through so many things. I've faced death four times. I have died and gone to heaven and come back. God bless you. I, I can actually feel your pain, by the way. And, uh, you know, may God bless you and, and, and protect you. Um, I'm going to tell you that as you were describing the suffering of Christ, you know, the anguish, the humiliation, the, uh, everything you were actually describing, the symptoms of a person who is demonically possessed. Believe it or not, uh, they are humiliated. They are torn down. They are down to their, uh, they're just holding on by a string to life itself. And that's pretty much what Christ went through. Of course, Christ is a different story, but the suffering is the same. And as a result, you know, we, uh, Wait, let me say this one thing, which is very important to you, Ron, and that is right now what you should be doing is getting some support. You need to go to your pastor. You need mm -hmm. to go to your church. You need to um, start um, opening up and sharing what's going on in your life. You can't do this by yourself. The demonic is very strong. The demonic is, uh, is uh, has been around since the beginning of time. They're outside time and space. That means that demons are thousands of years old. They know the human nature. They know your mind. They know uh, what, what your belief system is. And they know everything about you because they've been around for so long. So they're super intelligent. And as a result, it's very, very hard to go toe-to-toe uh, -to -toe with a demon. Your odds are better if you find someone who is actually in the ministry and they have a team and uh, and also we her to also have a medical person available and have all these things in place. Uh, and your chances are a lot better in regards to you surviving. Let's go to first time caller Donna in Kansas City, Missouri. Hello, Donna. You with us? Hello. Hear me? Yeah, there you go. Um, earlier this evening, to mark the occasion of the 13 days before the next Friday, the 13th, I conjured Satan in my living room through deep meditation to give me future insight. And I 
want to give my recollection with the bishop and see if he thinks any of it holds any biblical truth. Tell us a little more, Donna. Tell us a little more. Um, well, I saw visions of Egypt in three years from now. Um, I noticed very two very, very prominent known celebrities go to Egypt. And in three years from now, the Antichrist will be on Earth. What do you think of that, Archbishop? I think what happens is um, what your last caller said was actually very factual, very true. Satan is a liar. Everything and anything that you are receiving in regards to impressions from anything dark uh, is a deceitful lie. It's just they're trying to manipulate your thoughts and, and throw you uh, your attention in the wrong direction. Okay, don't believe anything Satan or any of his demons tell you because they are liars. What's the, what's the easiest way for an individual to fight off Satan? The easiest way is to understand and accept the fact that you can't do it yourself. You need to have a some type of support system. You need your pastor, you need a priest, you need your team. You need a lot of people. There are, are, you know, there's strength in numbers, and this definitely uh, falls into play. You need to make sure that you're not going to go toe-to-toe with a demon, because a demon uh, doesn't care how tough you are, because he knows all about you, and he knows exactly how to deceive you. And he could really do tremendous damage to an individual. So if you feel like you're even getting close to... uh, Close to that type of scenario, you have to get support. You have to go and and do what I just suggested in regards to support. Yeah. Does the does the person who knows they've that has been possessed know that they're possessed? Most of the time, they have said that they weren't even aware. Uh, some of them may have some brief moments of memory, but they are. Um, we have this defense mechanism in our brain of the children which is repression. Anything that terrorizes us, anything that's traumatic will actually be thrown way, way down into our subconscious mind. It will be repressed, and we won't remember anything. So I would say in the most cases, they won't be remember. And if they do remember certain things, it's, it's, it's a miracle. Sometimes people go to a hypnotherapist and they'll, uh, they'll do, uh, you know, um, the, the whole nine yards of regards to uh, experience some of the things that they uh, that they don't remember, and sometimes that works. Um, but I, as I said, um, yeah, it's uh, most of the time they're not even aware. What's What's the easiest way to get possessed? Um, let's see. The easiest way is to be um, to be curious about the unknown, to try to get more information about. Um, a spiritual power and uh, demonic influence. Uh, there are a lot of very famous celebrities that have made it uh, on top at record time. As a result, it's said that, uh, that they have allegedly made a deal with the uh, with the darkness. Go ahead, Joe. Yeah, Ron, I have a two-part question on the psychology and a second very spooky question. Uh, on the psychology, uh, if you look at Paul, right, uh, he asked for relief for some sort of issue. It could have been his violent tendencies or his eyesight. Uh, and the answer was to leave him in the same situation. My grace is sufficient. But if someone does have problems, shouldn't they continue to uh, uh, seek prayer for these maybe less obvious issues? that still may be involved temptation or something like that. And the second part of my first question is, uh, there seems to be a wider net cast by the, the demons these days. They're putting marijuana in gumbies. Kids could have that. Is there any indication within the exorcisms of the wider net being involved? 
uh, and that you know, you know like those uh, fishing boats that have those big nets, and and they just catch everything in those nets. And my second spooky question is, you know, when you hear of, uh, for example, during an exorcism in a room temperature situation and the walls turning to icicles, that makes me think that the devils could do something in the outer environment. I could be swimming, and they could cause a current change where I get caught in a riptide or hiking. Maybe they could throw a rock on the trail that I could trip over. And I wouldn't be able to anticipate that. Would you say that could happen? And then would you ask for an angel to protect you, anticipating that this could happen? Okay, there's like a, a three or four questions there. I'm going to go with the first one. Um, the Apostle Paul uh, had what some believe may have been a thorn in his side. And uh, he never asked God to heal him, but rather he just suffered with it. Um, but in Matthew 7, 7, um, it says, uh, Ask you shall receive, seek, and you shall find, knock the doors of open. Um, which tells me that you can ask God for healing. You could ask God for a blessing. You could ask God to use you to help someone else. Um, prayer is a very effective tool in terms of communicating to our maker. And uh, and I think that uh, prayer is, a, is an excellent way to do that and to establish a relationship with God. Okay, the second question, okay, um, uh, and, and I'm just like, you know, understand that my memory is not as good as it used to be, or the recall. Uh, you um, wanted to know what kind of powers does Satan have? Can he actually change the physical environment? I'm going to tell you that um, it's my honest belief, and according to Scripture, okay, um, Satan is the ruler of this world. Satan is in charge of everything. Satan can do anything, but God is in command of everything. And God is uh, has to give permission for anyone to do anything. It has to be within his will. So in other words... Satan can make anything and everything happy in terms of trying to tear down humanity, You're trying to tear down the person. But God will not allow anything unless he has his approval, unless it's on God's time. And that's really hard to understand, I know. But, um, but to answer your question, uh, the demonic doctors does have lots of power. They could make walls bleed. They could make uh, rooms frozen or hot or, or change the climate or could do anything within the immediate environment. Um, yeah, that's within their power, and they could do that. But God could also overrule any of that, and that's where the exorcist comes in. He has a series of prayers, and one of the prayers that I uh, use in, in my ritual is the St. Michael's Prayer. And the St. Michael's Prayer is so powerful uh, that it annoys. It annoys the daylights out of Satan or out of the demonic. You know, it just does not want to hear God, does not want to hear anything in regards to holy, because he's just the opposite. And so an exorcism is like a boxing match, okay? Um, the, your opponent is the darkness, and then you have the light, which is fight. So the exorcist is in the ring, and the demonic is on the other side, and you're boxing. And the exorcist is actually interrogating the demonic and trying to get his identity and trying to ask him, when are you going to leave the victim? How long are you planning to stay there? And who are you? And then so the uh, so the Exodus will continue to do that in a repetitious fashion until it wears down, until the demonic will actually be worn down because of the power of God. The cross, the crucifix, the, uh, the holy names uh, that are being thrown at the demonic, the demonic is getting weaker and weaker and weaker. Some exorcisms can take anywhere from a day to two, maybe two days, or it could take over a year. It just simply depends on what the situation is. If the individual has a multiple demonic possession, well, then it's obviously going to take a little longer. Uh, and so the same ritual is the same 
And it's the same over and over again. It's done in a repetitious fashion. And, and, and if the emphasis has a, a tremendous faith, then um, he will be victorious. Ever have a demon laugh at you, Archbishop? Yes. Oh, laugh, curse, spit, uh, throw things, um, all kinds of very violent uh, behavior. Um, blasphemy and everything, you know, the, the cursing, the, the, um, the, the physical assaults. Oh, yeah, that's, that's in play. Yeah, they'll do that because they look at you as an enemy. You obviously are because you're trying to evict the demon. The demon the dark spirit out of the individual. So he's going to fight. He's going to fight as, as hard as he can. They understand that the power of God is stronger than any demon, stronger than Satan himself. And if you use the right words, the right faith, and you're directing directly to the person who's possessed, you're going to be victorious. Next up, let's go to Jim in Connecticut. Welcome to the show. Hey, Jim. Hello. Hey, Peg. Uh, Archbishop, uh, pleasure to speak with you again, and I uh, thank you so much for the work you do. I had met you at the Southbury Exposition with uh, Bill Dean and uh, Bishop Lawn, et cetera, and uh, I was the uh, retired police officer that was attended with my wife. Oh, so yes, I'm, yes, yes. How are you? I'm doing very well, very well, thank you. And uh, it's, it was a very uplifting experience, and it hasn't faded at all. Things are doing quite well. But the issue I wanted to address with you was uh, something that concerned me at that time. Uh, it mentioned at the outset that uh, 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 many uh, uh, churches, et cetera, had been approached to host the event, and none would even reply. And I find that very disturbing, that the very basis of our Judeo-Christian beliefs, as well as many other world uh, belief systems, is on the fall of man and its ultimate salvation. And I'd like you to say, why, why do you think there seems to be such a reluctance, if not sometimes uh, opposition, to addressing the, the importance of uh, what uh, the evil is in the world? And uh, Because that's, really uh, that's really what it's all about, with fighting this, uh, this demon. That's true. Uh, what I'm going to say is not going to be very, uh, it's not going to be very pleasing to hear, but the truth of the matter is that the darkness is invading the Christian church. The darkness is actually infiltrating and actually coming into the church and corrupting a lot of the believers. And a lot of people say, what's well, the new age movement and all this other stuff that's mingling into the, you know, into the, uh, the Christian belief. But the point is that Satan will use anything and everything he can to corrupt us, to break us down, and to have us destroyed, because that's his own purpose. So the infiltration to this church is being threatened. And there's a lot of false prophets out there. There are a lot of, uh, uh, as you know, there's a lot of preachers out there that claim to be something that they're not. And as a result, they're either motivated by money, they're either motivated by fame, and whatever the situation is, it's false. And since it's false, it's not, it's not valid. And so as a result, there's so many people that are being prepared these days, and it's very alarming, to say the least. What did you think of the movie The Exorcist, Archbishop? I think it was uh, very accurate, about maybe 20%, maybe 15, 20%. Only reason I say that is they have recordings of what actually took place. They have, uh, they have documentation, uh, and, and, and everything has to be documented. If there's no documentation, it's like the tree falling in the forest. Who knows if the tree really fell in the forest if you're not there to witness it? Okay, you have to have some kind of, of tracking system, some kind of reporting system in order to validate. Does that make any sense? <laughs> and Russell Crowe played the, the Pope's uh, exorcist, uh, Bishop Gabriel, right? Archbishop Gabriel? Yes. You know, I'm, I'm so, um, I saw the movie, and um, I love Richard Crowe. I mean, he's a great actor. I mean, great actor. Richard Crowe, yeah. Right, right, Russ, Ru Russell. Russell, Ru Russell Crowe. Oh, yeah, perfect. Yeah, exactly. Uh, great actor. Okay. Um, this portrayal, okay, was very, um, uh, it was really false. Um, he uh, portrayed the uh, the chief exorcist as an alcoholic. Um, he portrayed him um, um, being very disrespectful to his superior. Um, there was a lot of things that I wasn't real pleased with. 
in terms of, of, of how they portrayed uh, the, the actual story. So um, uh, the special effects were interesting. And again, I like the actors, but, um, but you know, it it's, wouldn't be, it's nowhere near the, uh, the actual original movie, The Exorcist. That was, uh, that was probably the closest that you would get to something genuine. Next up, Joe in Montgomery, California. Hey, Joe, go ahead. Thank you for taking my call, George. Welcome, Joe. Well, uh, I do this type of work. It's not something that you ask to do, but it is something that you're being prepared probably most of your life in little ways. I wanted to become a spiritual teacher. Actually, I just wanted to become enlightened. That's all. Meditate, become enlightened, and save the world. Simple, right? <laughs> not so. You're going to learn you're going to grow. You're going to learn about everything, every single thing. Uh, you're going to get involved with this and get involved in that. You're going to see things. You're going to see miracles. You're going to perform miracles. And it's all through the Holy Spirit, the armies of God, and, of course, Lord Jesus Christ. My first exorcisms were with Christ. Actually, it was with the Holy Spirit, but then Christ. And then I went on to um, uh, St. Michael the Archangel which uh, we're with, my friend and I are with, all, every day we, we work with them. And there are other aspects to, this is like under the umbrella of psychic attack, and I know uh, uh, the good bishop knows that. And it's such a widespread field that he'd have to have like days and days and days just to give you examples. One of the things... And this is a big thing, deception. And there are people that will follow these um, pseudo uh, gurus, not even gurus, like beings uh, of light. They call themselves beings of light, and you're going to do this, and you're going to do that. They never challenge them in the name of Lord Jesus Christ. They never, And you have to do that several times. They never challenge them in the name of the Holy Spirit. You have to ask them, who do you, in whose name do you come? And you do it over and over again. Until they tell you, Lord Jesus Christ, uh, or the Holy Spirit, or God the Father, usually it's Lord Jesus Christ. Because you, they don't use those words. <laughs> they run from those words. Well, you know, you know what my impression is? is that, uh, the scripture even tells us uh, that uh, Satan, the devil himself, can disguise himself as an angel of light. And I get so concerned with people who have a relationship with their um, spiritual guide because they don't really know if it's a true guardian angel or just the opposite. Um, the, the darkness and evil, as you know, is very deceitful and will try to trick you. And especially when you're trying to, to, to enlighten yourself, the only enlightenment really comes from God, comes through the Holy Spirit, as you said. That's so true, Archbishop, so true. The Coast Mobile app is now available for download on iPhones and Android devices. You can become an insider directly through this app. This is a great option for our international listeners, and new users will also receive a free two-week trial.